Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Better Events Podcast. This is Mary Davidson, one of your co-hosts. And in today's episode, we are joined by a wonderful guest, Liz Lathan, and she is going to talk all about 2025 trends and engagement at events. This is a really awesome conversation. I found myself taking notes. I think that you're going to learn a lot. So we're excited to get into it. Welcome to the Better Events Podcast. Join two event strategists, Logan Clements and Mary Davidson, who believe we can all create, host, and attend better events. In this podcast, you will learn about event strategy and actions that you can use today as an event host, planner, or manager. Hear directly from the people who are creating innovative and inspiring events today and tomorrow and grow your business along the way. Now, let's get started and thanks for listening to the Better Events Podcast. Hi, friends. Welcome back to another episode of the Better Events Podcast. I'm one of your co-hosts, Logan Clements. And this week, we're excited to have a guest with us to talk all about the 2025 trends in engagement at events, Liz Lathan. And before we jump into introducing her and bringing her in, we do want to plug the 2024 Better Events Conference Early bird tickets are still on sale for these next two weeks. We hope you can join us. It's December 18th and 19th. We're doing one day in person, one day 100% virtual. So you can join us whether you're local or you know anywhere else in the world. You can visit bettereventspod.com slash conference to buy your tickets and learn more about the conference. And Mary, I'm going to hand it over to you to introduce our guest. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And I'm thrilled to introduce our guest today. Liz Lathan, CMP, loves connecting with people, whether that's inside her own community, Club Ichi, or at other events where she's hired to design experiences that drive connection. Liz's happy place is facilitating profitable relationships. So Liz, thank you for joining us. Is there anything else that you'd like to add? No, I'm just thrilled to be here. I appreciate the invitation. This could be awesome. Yes. A little bit for our listeners of why we asked you here, Liz. I feel like I've been a a fan from afar of your LinkedIn Mm -hmm. posts. I feel like you're someone who's adding a lot of value onto our feeds um, and just some of your interesting observations of being like an event plant, event marketer out in the wild of like what's working, you know, hot takes and all of that. And I look forward to your newsletter in my inbox. Um, So we're just really happy to have you here and talk about something that I think as an event producer, I wish I had more control over with some of the events I get brought into work, but um, event engagement, I just think this is so, so important. And we always start broad here on the podcast. So do you mind first defining for our listeners how, like, what is engagement at events? Uh, It's a great place to start because I think the word engagement is a lot like the word experiential or community. It's like an amorphous blob of a word that means nothing and everything all at once. So the way that I kind of frame it is to break it into cognitive, behavioral, and emotional engagement. And your event can do all three or it can do one. You just have to decide up front, what are you actually trying to accomplish? So all the way back to strategy, right? Why are we doing this? What's here? But if you're talking engagement, you need to understand what goal you're trying to take the ball to before you can start designing for it. I think that's a great place to start. I'm already like, I gotta write that down. <laughs> it's just it's <laughs> already already kidding. I love a good list. Like, I, so I appreciate that definition for sure. I well, want um, all about mnemonic devices too. So once we get into yeah. lists, I got a million of them. <laughs> all right, I'm gonna take a lot of notes. I'm ready. <laughs> um, okay, so how has event engagement evolved since 2020? Because we saw a shift during that time. So since then through now, how has it shifted? Right. Well, the the cognitive engagement I think is the biggest shift that we're seeing people already start to change based on you know. Um, attention spans and nobody wants to hear an hour long keynote anymore. This is the, like the talk that we hear. We have the attention span of a goldfish, no more than eight seconds. Everyone's a TikTok kid, whatever. But the reality is like, I'll still binge watch seven episodes of Grey's Anatomy. So it's not about the attention span. It's about the, the, relatability and interest and intrigue of the content that you're designing for. So I think that's the biggest thing that we're seeing is cognitive is one that people just jumped onto. Behavioral engagement, I don't think anyone has quite figured out what to do. It's just a whole lot of stuff. And it really means like I need to scan somebody's badge or I need them to go do the bingo card through the expo hall. And so I think there's just a lot of testing of different things. And I wouldn't say that there's one like, this is how you make people do things, but there's a lot of opportunities. And so we can shape accordingly. And now emotional engagement is the big shift that's happened since 2020, where we actually do care about how our attendees are feeling at events. And I kind of feel like leading up to the pandemic, we didn't care so much. We just put our event on, people came to it, they learned or they didn't, they met people or they didn't, and we didn't really care. We took their money and they were going to come back because they always come back. 
I'm not always coming back anymore. And so that emotional engagement piece is like there now, I think it was a Freeman study or something that said more people are coming to events for networking than content. And it's not by much, but it's like nine or 10% more. So you have to create the environment for that connection. Yeah, my background's in in, in in corporate events and nonprofit, but mainly sports are my favorite. And so I feel like of all the things I work, I think the most critically of my sports experience and some of that crafting of storytelling and like, Sports are an easy example of making fans and making super fans that are going to, you know, be a diehard and thinking about that for, yeah, like a conference or something outside of the sports industry and sports realm. I feel like so many organizers and event hosts are trying to tap into some of that. Yeah. But for, yeah, like for a conference or a user, you know, my, my user conference, how do I get them excited about it each year? So, um, well, here's the, the problem is that whose job is that? Yeah. It's not really the event manager's job because they're trying to make sure that everything goes well. And it's not the content people's job because they're trying to make sure that the right stuff is on the right screen. And the salespeople, well, it's their job to care about their prospects and customers, but not everybody else. So there's kind of like a gap in the role um, on the teams. Um, we don't really have an audience advocate as a position on the team. So I think it's an opportunity for event professionals to kind of take that by the horns and run with it. or it's an opportunity to step back and go, oh, I don't know, but you should be in charge. <laughs> but once once we kind of figure that out and assign the role, then I think we can make real progress. Do you think that's like something that's, so I guess it depends what people do in the industry. So whether it's a key stakeholder that they're trying to convince or it's like a client or something like that. I'm just curious because in my mind, I'm like, yeah, absolutely. I can see the value. And then I'm like, but how do I show that value to somebody else so that they will, yeah. you know, compensate for a role like that? Yeah, well, if you do take it back to the three types of engagement, what are we trying to accomplish? And if emotional engagement is something we need, then that sense of belonging is right up there in the, the value graphics, right? So people really want to come there. They want to feel a sense of belonging. So maybe we need to assign someone to welcome people in. Maybe instead of doing a completely touchless and humanless registration experience, we actually need to overcompensate on that and get our board of directors in there welcoming people, invite the sponsors to come into the registration area, welcome people in and give them the opportunity to play host and you know think of other ways to just kind of make that experience a little bit different um, or if it's the cognitive behavioral side then really just thinking through the design of how you're going to deliver content and kind of make that change yeah i think and so much of what we do with events is having to learn some things the hard way and so i was really intrigued <laughs> when we were talking to you about bringing you on about a, a, you know event engagement engagement at events do you have an example of like a lesson that you had to learn about engagement the hard way? I mean, I think that we all learn lessons about engagement the hard way at every event we go to because we sit there and we decide that our phone's more interesting than whatever content is happening. That's a lesson in engagement right there. Um, I am an extrovert. And so I love being around people and I get my energy from people. But every single networking event that I go to where I walk into a room and people are already in groups and I just don't have a way to get in or break in and I'm extremely uncomfortable with it and there's no activity that breaks the ice it's just like you get your cheese cubes and your drink and you try to like see if anyone notices you're alone like that's awful that's a lesson in engagement so it's really like what can you put in the center of the room or at the side of the room or have event wing people that brings the moth to the flame and lets the other moths that are also alone connect over something um, that's probably my biggest pet peeve and piece of advice yeah, Logan and I talk a lot about how as event, uh, event professionals, it's hard to attend events because we're always like <laughs> picking them apart because we're, you know, from the other side. And obviously we understand how much work it goes into it too, but like we just can't like chill out sometimes when we're at an event. We just have to see everything. And we so have I guess idea, like a wait lady whistle down of Bridgerton, like for the event industry and just having this whole conversation yes. that's like the gossip columnist calling out like they should go. <laughs> We love, we love some hot takes. So that's amazing. <laughs> we do. I also feel like it's also a great learning opportunity. I mean, that's what exactly. I talk to other planners. I'm like, you got to go to, you do have to go to events because, you, you know, you, you hear and read about things and surveys afterward and people complaining about the coffee ran out. And it's like, well, until you go and experience that, you can't get coffee during the seven minute break you got <laughs> between right. sessions. Like you're going to be like, no, yes, we do need the coffee there at that moment for that. <laughs> you know, you're asking a lot of me to sit in multiple sessions back to back that, mm -hmm. it, you know, until you experience it as a human, I feel like um, that can empower you and make you a better planner by doing it. 
it's also good to go to events outside of your industry and see how other people are treated because yes, we event people are very critical of other events, but then you, you can go into some really dry events for people that don't know what they're doing and kind of walk in and feel really good about yourself, but also learn some lessons and just say like, here are those points that I would have taken back to my team and added in some, you know, engagement or flair or warmth or coffee. <laughs> Before we continue with this week's episode, here's a quick ad about our 2024 Better Events Conference. If you're looking to grow and connect with other event pros, this conference is for you in December. It's going to be Wednesday, December 18th, Thursday, December 19th, two days of conference fun. The 18th on Wednesday is going to be all in person in Tacoma, Washington, just outside of Seattle. And then Thursday, December 19th is going to be 100% virtual. So we are launching early bird tickets, which is going to be the lowest price you're going to get for conference tickets on Wednesday, September 18th. And we're running that promotion for one month. So get your tickets. We are offering two different tickets this year, an all access pass that gets you both the in-person day on the 18th and the virtual on the 19th, as well as a general admission virtual only for Thursday, December 19th. We had so much fun at our first conference last year. We cannot wait to see you and meet you. So get your tickets at bettereventspod.com slash conference. What are some of the, you've, you've talked about lessons learned, but if we can go into like a common mistakes a little bit more, like common mistakes that you see event organizers and planners make when it comes to engagement um, and really talking through, you know, tips and tricks on how to get out of that, improve those sorts of mm. things. I do think it's the idea that we all tend to have that humans are just like ants, you know, and you drop your ants in the ant farm and they all get in there and then they know that they need to bury their dead and start making little tunnels and they know what to do. People aren't actually like that this day and age. When you drop us into a box full of sand, if there's no one there that's telling us what to do, we just get on our phone and wait for something, you know, like the extroverted salespeople know how to engage people. But the, a lot of folks, especially coming out after COVID are kind of like, hey, I left my house for this. If I'm not immediately being engaged, why am I here? So I think that's the, the biggest one is what kind of activity can you do that welcomes people in? And even if that's to the point of now they picked up their badge and you just have a big blank wall and some sticky notes and you have somebody saying, hey, what challenge are you here to solve this week? And just asking them to start contributing and create that wall of woes so now people can connect and go, oh my gosh, I have that challenge. And you even feel a sense of belonging there. Or maybe they took an experience profiles quiz or something before they came on site and they got assigned as you know the harmony or the whatever. And you get there and you're given a bracelet or a thing on your badge or a way to connect with other people that are like you. So helping people create that connection and not just expecting that they're going to walk up and be like, hi, I'm Liz. Who are you and where do you work? Totally. And I, yeah, I think I feel like I see some people too, who think if you have that new tool or that new app, or like you said, a bingo card to go through next, but if you just like give this to people, then they'll obviously know what to do with it. Mm -hmm. and and they'll just use it and not realizing how much like hand holding and education that you need to do to get into it like for especially yeah. for some of the more complex like gamification stuff that we saw virtually and then people are trying to figure out how to do it in person yeah um, I well i'm like putting that in your head right like okay i have an app it's got a leaderboard it's going to engage people or gosh, did I just put something in the hands of 5,000 people that forces them to be on their phone and not engaging with each other? So yeah. which one are you actually trying to optimize for? Yeah. My one positive one that you do now, you're, you're getting my wheels turning was that, uh, what was it? It was um, an independent, the independent IPEC that I went to in January, independent planners. It's done by North Star, but at registration, mm -hmm. they had puppies. So like oh, when you checked party. in your badge, they had a local <laughs> rescue that had just some puppies and some older dogs, doggos, but just like happy dogs looking to give you some pets, like mm -hmm. right when you eat for you to pet them just as you're picking up your badge. And it was such a funny way just to be like, wow, you made me smile at a process. It's not unenjoyable, but it's usually like the admin process of going to an event is yeah. picking up your badge. And instead I sat and cuddled with a dog for 15 But minutes. why don't we think like that? Like nobody likes to stand in line, but Disney knows that and they make the lines fun. Like while you're in line, you're getting to engage with things and you're getting to have fun and do stuff. Why can't we do things like that? I mean, just stick a box of kittens with laser pointers in the middle of the room and people will have a blast. Mary, laser pointers and kittens. Make a I'm note here for it. Like, say no more. <laughs> I'm, I'm Cat Lady Liz. So, any cat I get, like, absolutely. Yes, sold. <laughs> um, any other trends? Or we can kind of start talking about trends, I guess, yeah. more. So, um, 
if you could list some trends, we can go, we can maybe focus on one, talk about it and then go to the next one. So what are some of the trends that you're seeing as we go into 2025 and end 2024? And what does that kind of mean for our listeners and events? Yeah, um, I think the the content side of the trends when you think about cognitive engagement is definitely shorter sessions. We're seeing these trends, but it doesn't necessarily mean put people in a room for 20 minutes and then kick them back out and make them move all the time. It's really just running speakers through so that you can you don't you can kind of context switch from each one. And it's not just one dude on stage with one long PowerPoint talking about all the product launches that are happening next year. So um, I my favorite thing, but I wouldn't say this is a current trend because I've been pushing this since 2017, but it's to make that that main stage feel more like a TV show and less like a presentation. Because if I sitting in the audience feel like I'm part of a live studio audience and I'm watching an MC and a news desk and the weather station kind of thing and the content's coming on like that, now not only have I optimized that show for a digital audience, so when I'm recording it, my at-home audience feels like they're watching a show, but my audience in the seats there actually feel like they're part of a live studio audience and they know when to applaud and it just feels more engaging. I'll watch that for two hours, you know? I don't have to feel like I'm sitting there watching one dude talk and I'm like, okay, I'm on my phone now. If it, if your entire event could have been a podcast, why did you fly there? So I think that's the number one, number one one is that cognitive engagement piece, um, the trend I see. And then I think also, I think it probably fits into cognitive as well, but it's designing the agenda with more white space. It's definitely starting to become vogue. People are starting to realize that not everyone wants to be overscheduled all the time. And my biggest piece of advice is instead of that 15 minute afternoon coffee break where you have only enough time to go to the bathroom, get coffee and check a couple of emails, make it a 45 minute co-working break. And like actually call it that and give tables and plugs and let people know that this is your time. You don't have to network in this time. You don't have to only get your snack and get back in. Take a minute, clear your emails out so that that rest of the afternoon you can go back in fully engaged. I love to try to, you know, get people the space that they need and not make them feel anxious. I love the co-working break. I feel like though I can already hear my Maybe my older school thinking of like, well, Liz, I'm paying every, for every hour that folks are on site. Like we need to be, you know, that would make longer breaks probably means longer of it, like longer, more days on site potentially mm. if I have to space things out. Like have mm. you had in your experience, yeah. like what is kind of your, your counter to that? Um, my counter is that we have to prioritize. We're drinking from a fire hose. We're in an omni-channel world. We're getting slacked and WhatsApped and SMSed and emailed and smoke signaled at all hours of the day and night. And so if we can give our attendees that space, then they can actually physically and cognitively contain and actually ingest more content. If you are continuing to just force stuff at them, then okay, you had you know a three-day event, but what did they leave with? They don't remember anything. They didn't have the space for it because they were having to do all of that work during the sessions. So they just didn't intake any of it. But if we can design it and give them the time and space to not only feel well, but brain well, then we can get more out of them and hopefully convert them more. So I good. love these ideas. Yeah, it's so simple. I mean, it I don't want to oversimplify it, but like, it's not that crazy of a concept. Everything you're saying, I'm like, yes, that's actually like something that we could definitely implement. Like, that's really not like that challenging to be able to do. And but doesn't cost any more money. Me. Yeah. <laughs> and, but I don't see events doing it that often, I have to say yeah. either. And so I, it's just interesting. I think this is maybe, I don't know, is an industry thing, like something where we just get on board in the planning process and it's like logistics, 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 like we're not really hitting some of these things that are not that hard to accomplish. So I don't know, I'm intrigued. It's definitely, it's definitely opening my mind a little bit about this. Well, I think we as the event professionals are kind of stuck in the middle. You know, sometimes I feel like we're the ones that the executives and the content teams have decided what the content is and we're handed an agenda. And we kind of feel like our hands are tied. We have nothing to do. We just need to make sure that the event happens. Um, and so I think we all just as an industry need to work together to find our voice and make sure that we can tell people, look, there are actually humans coming to our events. And if we don't take care of the humans and their brain space, then they're not going to give you the output you want from them because you want them to hear about the product launch. You want them to take the sales call when the event's over, you want them to buy something. And if they came to your event and only hung out with people because they were so busy that they didn't go to the sessions, you kind of missed the boat in the first place. So I think, um, you know, having more strategic conversations around pipeline and revenue and account-based marketing and all of the words that get you in the door from a marketing conversation and a business conversation, I think will help elevate all of us to be able to push back a little. Yeah, Mary and I, and we, we plugged it at the start here, but we are planning our own conference that's the end of this year, and it's our second year doing it. And I said it was such an interesting and fun exercise to do, 
to have all that power because so many times we get brought in afterward and you know, you're dealing with the aftermath or the or the negative comments about it. And you're like, at this point, I can't change. I personally can't change mm -hmm. it. We're just making the best of what we've got. But having that the privilege of getting to design something, I feel like Mary and I, we had to like save our save ourselves from ourselves sometimes because there was like we have so much content we want to give people. But right then we're breaking our own rule of saying, don't overfill the schedule. Like it's always easier said than done. And, right. Um, but so this is where we talk about trends. Let's talk about the next trend, which is community. So yeah. um, I think that there's a huge, huge problem with what I call community fatigue at this point. Everyone's starting a community. I can't be in 17 Slack channels and 42 Mighty Networks and like, oh my God, make it stop. But when you are looking at your event, as the start point or the end point for your community and the content and conversations begin there. The 365 community idea is simply a new and additional path for you to create and, and like distribute additional content. So yeah, you had so much stuff that you wanna put together for this event, but let's prioritize. We wanna get the people together. We want these core things to happen. And now how do we drip out some of these other ideas that we've had throughout the year? I think that's where this whole community and 365 thing can really help. I love that. I think that's true. Uh, we also launched a community this year, Liz. So, <laughs> we're like, so I'm like, okay, you keep taking the notes. This is great. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think it was with that intention for sure. Sometimes it's easier said than done, but we, but I'm totally yeah. with you. And, and yeah, I mean, community is so important. It's something that people are talking about and craving. And we've had just a lot of people reaching out about community and talking about the, the topic of it, and, but it's interesting. So I think that's a great point. Um, well, are there and the, yeah, we talked about mnemonic devices, right? So here's my one about community. So anyone that's at events that wants to, so first of all, let me break community into two things. You can either create a sense of community or you can create a community. A sense of community may be enough for your event. And that is a feeling of belonging, the ability to network in a kind of walls down, raw, not transactional, but more meaningful experience. Now you have a sense of community that people will stay in touch afterwards and you don't have to make sure that happens. Then you have the actual community, which is all that wonderful stuff happens, but you are in charge of creating the environment to keep them in touch. So we like to call it the five S's of community. You do not have to have all five, but it's a good structure to think about that can kind of align with your marketing funnel. So it's the show, the site, the series of gatherings, the sounding board, and the shareable moment. So the show is what is your top of funnel engagement action that gets people involved in your community. Yours is probably this podcast right here. Maybe you have a newsletter or a LinkedIn newsletter or something, but what's the top of funnel that lets those outside experience it and also lets your people in your community share on that, on that network. Then you have the site, which is your asynchronous communication channel. It could be Facebook groups, Slack channel, Discord, whatever you decide to use for your community. Then there's the series of gatherings. That's your events. That's your, if you have monthly virtual things, whatever programs you have to bring your people together. Then you have your sounding board. So who are your five to seven people that are like your inner circle? And they could be different people every quarter. It could be your customer advisory council, but who do you bring together to make sure the content you're creating in the community is right for the people in your community? And then the shareable moments. What are those things that happen inside your community that your community members can share out to make themselves feel like I was a part of this? And then also what content are you creating that just becomes your share moments that points right back to your show, which then starts it all over again and it becomes a whole flywheel. I, I want to drill in though on one that you just you dropped it out so so casually, but about was it customer customer advisory council? Mm -hmm. I yeah, I feel like I would love to hear more about that just for our listeners because Mary and I we had an advisor board that we had for our conference and that was really helpful with getting mm -hmm. some outside feedback on things. But how have you seen that implemented at events? Yeah, well, and I put that in your sounding board because it's a small group and it can either be customers or prospects or community members or just randos. If you if it just get some outside perspective, um, but it's really it does not have to be super formal. It can be a group of people that you get on a Zoom. You ask them some questions and you tell them the direction you want to take things in, ask them questions, get their feedback and then shift accordingly. Or it could be a formal program where you actually invite 15 people to be a part of an annual advisory council and you kind of do touch points throughout. So there's many ways to do that. But I think it's really just about getting the pulse of the industry outside of yourself, because very often we kind of create communities for ourselves five years ago, right? Like I know I can help those people and those people were me. But then if you get outside perspectives, then you can kind of shift that a little bit and make it even more relevant for things you didn't know about. I just really want some of my corporate and nonprofit clients to do this. <laughs> that's so, mm -hmm. I'm like, we're just planners listening to this. I just feel like that's, an, a, you know, you're, you're talking about for community building, but I'm like, even just for growing your event, 
A hundred percent. And I would do two. I would do an attendee advisory council and a sponsor advisory council, sponsor slash exhibitor, because two very different perspectives. And if you can do that six months before your event and get input and insights from them, tell them what the plan is, what the theme's looking like, where you're trying to go. They freaking love to give you feedback. And it does not have to be long, an hour, 90 minutes on a Zoom, like facilitated or like put it on a mural board. Just ask them questions. People love to answer them. Yeah, no, I think that's just such a dynamic way. Hopefully that's something, listeners, you can just adopt for 2025 and we'll all have mm -hmm. better events. Um, Liz, do you have another trend as we look at event engagement for the new year? Mm. Um, getting people off site, not, again, not a big trend, but definitely something attendees are looking for now. They're no longer looking to travel to an incredible location to just not see it. So creating micro events going along with that kind of back to nature or thinking outside the ballroom idea is, people creating micro events along with the conference, whether it's an ancillary program or actually part of the conference or sponsored events, just getting those small groups together for more intimate networking outside of the conference um, and doing something engaging that's not just getting a sports suite at you know the local game, but actually doing something like a graffiti experience or a sushi rolling or something that gets them engaged. Um, I think that we're seeing a lot more of that. And the festivalization of events has kind of been happening over the last couple of years where events are starting to feel much more like a big consumer music festival with all sorts of crazy stuff happening. So I think that's dying down just a little in favor of a little bit more targeted micro event strategy that gets people outside together. I love this. And I think even it's like you were saying, we need to remember that people are human and they're attending these events because when we attend as event professionals, at least myself, I always try if it's somewhere else, I try to like either at least go early for six hours or extend six hours or to a day or maybe even two days yeah. and like actually experience it. Cause a lot of times we get to go to these cool properties and stuff. And I'm like, I haven't done anything here and I'm just working the event. So I'm going to just stay and enjoy it a little bit because we're human, just like the attendees are during the event. And so I love that. I think that's a, Super cool call out. Are there any other trends that you want to call out? Um, let me think. Let's see. I think, um, I, again, I, would I call it a trend? So the, I got two of them. My negative trend is one that I call registration. <laughs> and that means that people are not registering until a week before your event, which is disastrous and awful and terrifying because your hotel cutoff was 30 days out, but no one registers till 12 days out. And it's a huge frustration point for everybody. So um, the trend being, how can we actually change that whole FOMO registration process to get people to register or at least commit that they're coming so that you don't freak out about the hotel piece? Um, and instead of seeing that, that early bird rate in the beginning, because we're finding people are actually not price conscious when it comes to registering. It doesn't affect them that it's going to cost more later. It's instead, can you do like VIP access to things earlier? So if you can get your 150 people to register six weeks out um, and they are getting front row at your concert or meetings with certain executives or invitations to the micro event that's going to the graffiti park or whatever, then getting them in early is driving the early registration and kind of making it less scary for you at the end. Um, so negative trying to turn positive. And then my other one is one that we call Zenection, which is that whole wellness at events thing. And it's really difficult to manage because everyone just originally, when you hear wellness at events, is like, great, my 6 a.m. yoga class is scheduled, done, check. Um, but it's definitely more of holistic thinking about the events. And my friend Dave Stevens, he's at a company called Olympian Meetings, and he, he talks about the four M's um, of really trying to put wellness in your event. And it's finally catching on. He's been <laughs> talking about it for years. Um, but I, let's see, it is meals, movement, mindfulness, and meaning. And I think the trend of actually thinking about your event and are we doing nutritious meals and snacks and making sure that our people have the ability to actually consume content or did we feed them carbs all morning and expect them to be able to think at 10 o'clock in the morning? Um, the mindfulness piece is it's less about yoga at 6 a.m. and more about are you giving them that white space and not overfilling their schedule? Are you giving them choices and not trying to guilt them into showing up to stuff? 
Um, the movement is, again, not trying to put the 5K at the beginning of the day, but how can you incorporate something during the day that allows people to move around? Puppy yoga, or you could, you know, make something a little bit different and weird. Um, or can you do like walking sessions where people are actually walking and talking? I don't know, coming up with something to get them moving. And then the the meaning part is events have become so transactional lately. It's like I'm I'm there to sell things or I'm there to meet people or and I have to do an exchange of value for my badge. So how can we actually give people time to truly connect, solve problems together, co-create things in the future and get a reason to continue to connect? So the Zenection piece is like Zen and connection, putting those together and creating activities that make people connect over something that's more and I'll come back to it, meaningful and transactional. Those are great, Liz. I, I feel like you're giving me a lot of hope for 2025. I know <laughs> I feel like every new year is always so hopeful as we're getting into it. But um, these are all all trends that make me want to go to different events. Yeah. Um, and so I'm hoping they get kind of we, we, we can slowly build that momentum for a wider adoption because I do think some of the big uh, you know, big companies with big budgets are maybe, you know, adopting these faster than maybe the smaller ones that find it a little bit difficult. But you named a couple things in there that don't cost money, like you mentioned, which I know can be kind of the the yay or nay for some clients. Um, yeah, I but, think that's my my number one, I guess, key point that I want everyone to take away is that you can craft these ideas to not add to the budget and or you can kind of change some of the places where you already have budget and just rearrange them. I don't think that any way of creating more engagement or even in kind of enhancing your event with some of these trends has to cost money. And especially in this economy right now, like nobody's looking to add to their budget. We are all trying to figure out how we're gonna manage $140 gallons of coffee with <laughs> increased everything else. Yeah, no, and, and you kind of answered our, our second to last question for you, but it's just what excites you about the future of mm -hmm. events um, and event engagement? I'm excited because more and more people are actually talking about it. Even if they're not quite implementing it yet, this is step one, right? Admit you have a problem. <laughs> so I'm super excited that the industry as a whole has started to admit we have a problem, which means that things are going to change in 2025. And I'm really excited about that. I'm excited about that too. I think that's a great point. And you know, we'll, we'll have to circle back to this and see what actually happens. I hope change is faster than slower, but you know, we're going to get there for sure. So steps. just keep swimming. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Liz, this has been wonderful. Seriously, thank you so much. I feel like I've learned so much. I'm sure our listeners have learned so much as well. Before we let you go, can you let us know if there's anything else that you want to add and also where listeners can find you and follow along? Yeah, I think the one thing I would add is if you look at that job description and the swim lanes and know who's got what project and you notice that there is nobody thinking about not just how who designs the box, but what happens inside the box, take it upon yourself to go, you know what? I would love to take a stab at how the attendees experience the event. And when we talk attendee journey, it's not just, well, they're going to go to a keynote and then they're going to have a break. It's what are the people going to do? So if you just want to take that on and talk to somebody about it, that is my one big action for you is like, just start thinking about it now and just ask questions. Even if you don't implement it at your next event, ask questions, take notes at it, and then see if you can start to implement it next time. I think that we can make that change. Um, and as for finding me, I am all over LinkedIn, Liz Lathan on LinkedIn. Um, join our community, Club Ichi. It is free to get into. It's weareichi.com and come hang out with other B2B event professionals having these conversations. And then if you want our help to do some of the stuff at your events, that's what the Community Factory exists for. Amazing. Thank you so much, Liz, for being here. Thank you. This was so fun. It was so fun. Thank you so much. And <laughs> we are going to turn the time over to our bonus tip, which Logan has for today. I do. And this bonus tip is related to any event planners out there who are looking for business. I'm encouraging you to make sure kind of on theme with this talking about community is check with your network. I feel like I recently have heard from some planners and producers that they're feeling a little bit of a slowdown this fall. And just this week, I had three different people ask me if I knew anyone who could work their event. And for me, I realized I know people, they're just not top of mind. I'm like picking my brain, trying to remember who I talked to, who has that specific skill set that this person was looking for. So please, please don't be afraid to check in with your people, your past clients, your past colleagues, mentors, you name it. Just you never know what work could come your way if you're just becoming top of mind. So make sure that you're in contact with your network and you'll see some business from it. 
That's a great reminder and great bonus tip, Logan. So thank you so much. And thank you so much, everybody, for listening to another episode of the Better Events Podcast. We super appreciate you and would love for you to follow us on social media or LinkedIn at Better Events Pod. You can send us an email at bettereventspod at gmail.com. And you can also connect with Logan and I directly on LinkedIn. We'd love to hear from you there. And if you want more Better Events content, make sure that you register for the 2024 Better Events Conference at bettereventspod.com slash conference. And you can also join our private community on Substack. So thank you so much, everybody, for listening. And we will be back with you again next Wednesday.